So, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us here at the LMA for the second of our winter warmers here. Um, very, very pleased to see you all, some of you joining us in person, some of you online. And I'm delighted to have with us today local historian Mark Aston, who's going to be telling us about a hugely important local event, the Clerkenwell Explosion, and he will be joined by actor Chris Millington. After the talk, uh, there'll be time to have refreshments. We have biscuits and drinks for you. Um, and I'd also like to ask you to fill in a short form at the end, if that's OK. So I'm going to hand over now to Mark. Thanks, Claire. Just put this on. OK, well, thank you very much for coming. And welcome to the London Metropolitan Archives here. Uh, I'm Mark Aston, um, erstwhile local historian and historiographer, historiographer, and it's my pleasure to present tonight, uh, this afternoon's uh, talk, Arthur Abbott and the Clerkenwell Explosion. And my sort of partner in crime today is Chris Millington, who will be presenting us with a few readings from the narrative. Um, some of you may well know the story behind the explosion, some may not. In some circles, it's very, 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 very well known and forms part of, I suppose, the historical narrative of the um, Irish nationalist movement way back in 1867, really to present day with some, some people saying that the struggle for them still goes on. 
but um, this is very much a local story. In the past, the story has been, um, has been well detailed. It's been um, documented, academics, um, authors have, have looked at the explosion, but they've very much done it through a nationalist or a national and international um, sort of perspective. But this time I'd like to have a look at the, the local. It's very much a local history uh, story. Uh, often is not forgotten, often um, a statistical footnote in a, a, a bigger tome, an academic tome. So what we're going to have a look at, as I say, is the local history side of things, the human story. And local history is a little bit about people in places over time. And very much uh, this is a story of a person or people, a uh, person in this case, uh, Arthur Abbott, in time in a particular place. It's sort of history from the bottom up, if you like. Um, but we'd like to give you the human story today um, in this sort of physical context. Now, my own interest uh, goes way back when once I was uh, local history manager at Finsbury Library, local history centre and museum. And amongst the treasures, many treasures that we've got both at the museum and the archive are the records of the Clark and Well Explosion Relief Fund. And my interest was not just from a local point of view, um, this important local event that took place, but also from, I suppose, a family history point of view. My own great-grandfather and mother lived just around the corner in what was then Coburg Street, just around the corner from where the explosion happened. Coburg Street is no longer with us. It sort of forms Skinner Street. But they would have certainly heard the explosion if they'd been at home and certainly would have seen the, the aftermath of it. And also, just around the corner from Coburg Street, we have Woodbridge Street, which is still with us today. I had extended family there. So going through some of the records, I was in a way hoping that I might see them, not because they were injured anyway, but were they featured? Did they, were they, was their, uh, their home um, destroyed or injured in some way? Or even did they uh, donate? Um, mixed blessings, really. They weren't in the, the records. Um, not even donating to the, the fund afterwards, but I like to think they might have put a, a, a few pence in the sort of church box on, on, uh, on, uh, on other occasions. Um, so that's, that's my sort of background, but going through, going through the, um, the, the records, I came across Arthur Abbott, Arthur Henry Abbott a lot, and his family. He popped up a lot. He, um, well, we're gonna hear his story now, so I'm gonna give too much away. Um, so let's start. Right, Corporation Row, Clark and Well, literally just round the corner. If we pull the blinds away here, we can see Corporation Row. February 24, it looks very, very quiet. Um, in fact, it's a very quiet street. Um, little oasis in the middle of Clark and Well. Um, nothing particularly distinguishing apart from a brick wall and the old Hugh Middleton School you see in the background there. But it's hard to think that this was the scene of one of the most infamous uh, events of its day, and certainly in Clerkenwell, and one that the residents certainly weren't prepared for. And by the, the magic of slides, let's go back to 1867 and give you a view of the, the aftermath of the street there. Now, this is Corporation Lane. Back then, it was known as Corporation Lane. Today, it's Corporation Row. But the scene is completely, completely the opposite. Rather than being tranquil, there's absolute havoc and chaos that was, was caused by an explosion in the street. The wall, as you see there, has a massive hole in it, 60 foot across. I just want to stand yeah, okay. Just there, Sorry. All right. We'll, 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 we'll dissipate, we'll dissipate sure. Okay. That. Um, as you see, the, the destruction to the wall there, 60 foot across, 20 feet at the base. Uh, everyone up in arms, rubble everywhere, people injured as we see in the corner there. And on the right hand side, we have uh, residences very, very close to the, um, to the scene. So absolutely, absolutely uh, taken by surprise. This would have been about 3.45 p.m. on Friday the 13th of December. So dusk was just settling in, uh, end of the working day and all of a sudden mayhem. Now, we're going to introduce you to Arthur Abbott early. Uh, this is Arthur Abbott, not in 1867, but in 1937. And as far as we know, uh, some of you may say otherwise, but this is the only surviving picture of one of the 
the victims, one of the injured of the, of the Clerkenwell explosion. Uh, he's 75 years old here, and he was interviewed in the street in Hoban uh, on the 70th anniversary of the, the, um, the explosion. And he was interviewed for the newspaper, the London Evening News, on the 14th. Or oh, this came out on the 14th, so the previous day would have been the 70th anniversary. And the headline, Blind Man in Hoban, Victim of Fenian Outrage 70 Years Ago, Prison Wall Blown Down, and it goes on. But just want to draw your attention to the right-hand side there. Um, around Arthur's neck, and I believe he had this for many, many years, uh, on the streets, uh, plying his trade as a match seller, blind, caused by the Fenians, blowing up of the House of Detention, Clark and World, December 13th, 1867. I partly recovered my sight and was in employment until 1890, but my sight failing, I was discharged. And from then on, he plied his trade in the street. But Arthur was only five at the time, uh, but he did experience it. Hopefully he didn't remember too much of what happened to him. But we're going to hear from Arthur now, and he's going to recount his story. Uh, as was told 70 years after the explosion. Whoops. Mark, I'm actually going to ask you to pass the lapel mic to, to Chris. Just so okay. Okay. And I'm hoping we're back in business. Yeah, we're back in business. There we are. I think just be very careful not, not to touch that as we're oh, passing it. Right, that's yeah. entirely my fault. Oh, right, just that that there. And maybe Chris, can I ask you maybe to repeat the first reading as well? So everyone yeah, sure. Has sure, yeah. That. Yeah. Do you want to go back? Yeah, that's all right. Yes, it's just 70 years since I lost an eye when the Clerkenwell prison was blown up by Irish Fenians to release some of their party there. It was directly opposite our home in Corporation Row, overlooking the prison. There's a council school there now. And all our family suffered. My sister Minnie was one of the killed, and Barrett, who fired the gunpowder, was the last man hanged publicly in England. 
Our house was wrecked and mother was terribly cut about the head. My brother John, he was 13 at the time, was much the same. William was cut by flying glass. Annie, she was only two, was taken to the Royal Free Hospital with me. The others were in Barts, except Minnie, she was eight, who was killed, as I said. My right eye was destroyed then, and the other eye went when I was 28. I was a coppersmith, but my sight gradually got worse and I couldn't work. I came to this for a living. That was in 1890. When Burke and Casey were awaiting trial in Clerkenwell, a desperate plot was hatched to release them by blowing down the prison wall when they were at exercise. A man wheeled a big barrel into Corporation Row, placed it against the prison wall and borrowed a light from 13-year-old John Abbott, Henry's older brother. Children were playing in the street, a milkman was on his round and women were gossiping. The man lit the taper in the barrel and slipped away. A terrific explosion roared across London. The prison wall was breached for 60 feet, houses were shattered, bricks and glass hurled about, and the street was strewn with dead and injured, nearly all mothers and children. Six were killed, 11 died later, and more than 120 were wounded. The plot failed entirely in its objective, for, scenting trouble, the governors had the prisoners exercised in the morning instead of the afternoon. Five hundred extra police were posted immediately after the explosion, and a detachment of the Scots guards marched up to hold the prison. Queen Victoria sent her own doctor, Sir William Jenner, to visit the sufferers, and writing to the Queen, he said... A little child between five and six years had one eye destroyed and the other eye so injured that no hope of preserving the sight is entertained. That little boy is the blind man who has stood awaiting arms in Hoban for nearly 50 years. He has no blind pension. He is married and each morning his wife brings him to his post from Hermes Street, Pentonville Road. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Oops. Just in case it does. Right, well, that's quite a, quite a tale. Um, poor Arthur, and also poor Rose. I mean, Rose, his wife, who we'll meet a little bit later on, would escort Arthur to his pitch in Hoban in 1937. She was uh, 75 years old herself, uh, 76 years old herself and it would be about an, a mile journey from where they lived in Hermes Street. So um, we, the, the, that knock-on effect of what happened to Arthur must have been absolutely devastating for her uh, as well. But back to 1867, um, what we see here is um, an engraving from, of all likely places, the Leipzig Illustrated um, newspaper. This was such an international event that um, papers were very quick to, to report on it. And what more better than, than an engraving? This is one of my, um, I'll say favorite ones, but the most evocative, one of the most evocative. We can see the damage caused by the, by the explosion just in the center there and see how close the, the houses were to the prison wall itself. Um, and the vantage point, wherever this person was, uh, obviously captures it all there. But this was one of many, many engravings uh, that depicted the scene, the aftermath. And here's another one, uh, courtesy of uh, Tom and the LMA here. This is, a, uh, I believe, a watercolour that was painted, obviously, sometime after the event. But, um, but it shows you, the, again, the sort of artistic impression of the, the damage itself and how tall the, 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 the wall was and how close they were to the, the opposite houses. We're looking about 8 metres or about 24 feet. Um, and as uh, Arthur himself said, the uh, Clerkenwell prison was blown up by Irish Fenians to release some of their party there. It was directly opposite to our home in Corporation Row, overlooking the prison. There's a council school there now. 
Well, Arthur and his family lived at number five Corporation Lane, and it and neighbours at number 3A um, w uh, received the full brunt of the blast. As mentioned, many, uh, many different sort of depictions. This one shows you a little bit more of the, the damage caused to the, to the houses opposite. And this was the uh, Illustrated Times, 21st of December, just a week afterwards. Um, the appetite to learn about the um, explosion was insatiable. Uh, and certainly, um, it sold newspapers, as well as informing people. Of course, literacy rates weren't particularly high in 1867, particularly amongst the working classes. So a picture like this would, would tell a thousand words sort of thing. Now, this is the view um, looking from east to west, uh, similar view we had when we started the show. Um, do you see the, the fence at the end there? Well, either end of the street was fenced, uh, obviously to stop people looking in, but that didn't stop a form of disaster tourism. Almost immediately after the uh, explosion, people flocked to the area. It's always been a busy area, but people flocked to the area. Pubs made, uh, made a great trade. Uh, there was even one incident of a local uh, resident who lived in Rosamond Street, which is the street just running parallel here. He had a good vantage point and he was charging sixpence for people to view the devastation from the top of his house. So uh, you know, where there's a disaster, there's obviously money as well. And as I say, the newspapers were full of it. I think there was even a sort of uh, pickpocketing uh, gang sort of in, in town because the amount of people around, which is uh, pretty, pretty dreadful. We've had a lot of, uh, we had a lot of engravings and, and watercolours here, but here we have a very rare thing, which is a photograph of the devastation. And this was taken uh, a few weeks after the, the explosion by someone called Henry Bedford Lemaire. Some of the historians amongst you might recognise the name. It was his son, Hedri uh, same name, that came to fame, that photographed a lot of Edwardian London and buildings. But Henry uh, was, um, was, uh, was uh, preceded him taking this sort of photograph. Um, there's a whole series of these, and we'll have a look at a couple a bit later on. Now, uh, Henry wrote to the local town clerk in Clerkwell to say, can I go and photograph this? And he said, yes, you can, and you can display it, but any profits to the photograph or your photographs would go towards the, the relief fund, go towards the relief of the victims, which he was quite happy to do. And we're coming backwards in, uh, forwards in time again, just to show you the view today. So once again, coming full circle, you wouldn't imagine that sort of devastation would take place. There's not an awful lot left of... of uh, Corporation Lane as was, except for the wall, of course. The wall is still there. It's the original wall. The hole was patched up, um, but the wall itself was the original prison wall built in around 1847. Uh, it's, it's very much reduced in height now. Um, the prison itself closed in 1877 and demolished around about 1890. Then Hugh Middleton School, which we caught a, caught a glimpse of earlier, was built and opened about 1893. But they retained the, the perimeter wall, although reduced it in sight. There's also um, the Warden's Lodge still on site. Some of you may have seen on the corner of Sands, uh, Sands Row and um, Rosamond Street, or Clerkenwell Close, sorry. And also, at one point, um, you could actually go down and visit the, uh, the basement. The basement is cells are still intact. Uh, I remember going there when it was a museum to have a look around. Now it's, it's, it's closed to the public, but on occasion, particularly around Clerkenwell, I think media month in uh, May, uh, often as not they have uh, exhibitions and demonstrations there. Buy a ticket and you can, you can go and have a look at uh, what's left of some of the cells in the basement. But Although we've heard a little bit about the story, and before we go on to Arthur's uh, story, I'm just going to just go over a, a few sort of brief, brief details, tell, give you a sort of sense of location and place as well, and it sets the scene for Arthur's story as well, as too. Now, this map from 1870 shows you the Middle Essex House of Correction. Um, we're here at the London Metropolitan Archives. B is Corporation Lane, where the explosion took place, and C is the House of Detention. Middlesex House of Detention, the prison, Clerkenwell Prison. As I say, if I pull the blinds apart, 
we can see all of those, all of those sort of B and C, the sites at B and C. What they didn't include on this map was the outline of the, the prison. Whether that was for potential escape purposes, I'm not sure. But I did find one in an earlier map. And there it is. Gives you some idea of the, um, the layout of, the, of the, um, the prison. And a closer look at the prison with Corporation Lane at the top and Rosamond Street on the left-hand side. There's been a prison on this site since the 17th century, early 17th century. In fact, two prisons, uh, Bridewell Prison and the Clerkenwell Prison. But in 1845, uh, those were <coughs> demolished and a new prison, a house of detention or a remand prison was built. And it opened in 18, uh, 1847 in October. I uh, just want to draw your attention to the exercise yard on the right hand side there. See how close it is to the wall. Now, introduce you to another character in the story. And this is this character called Rickard, or Richard O'Sullivan Burke. Um, Arthur mentioned, and also our, our um, article mentioned, that the explosion was uh, a jailbreak, basically. It was to release, try and release um, two prisoners of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, or the Fenians, uh, from prison. Uh, this man was very important to the cause. He was born in Cork in Ireland in 1838, and he had spent a lot of time, a lot of military, uh, uh, getting a lot of military experience during the American Civil War. But an Irishman through and through, and a nationalist through and through, he came back um, to join the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which was formed in Dublin in the late 1850s. The word Fenian comes from the old tribal, uh, the Fianna tribe, um, but it's very much an Americanism. We tended to know them over here as the IRB or the Irish Republican Brotherhood. But it was important for the cause uh, to get uh, um, uh, Burke out. The Irish and Republican Brotherhood were an organisation that was, uh, was, was, was bent on Irish nationalism. And by whatever means they could achieve that, they would. So they were seen as uh, certainly an illegal outfit, but also a very dangerous one as well. But it was him... Uh, and his colleague, a guy called Casey, who was a, a lesser known uh, member, that they wanted out. Now, the story goes that uh, whilst they were exercising on the 13th of December, during the, during the afternoon, their compatriots would uh, come, uh, come to the prison wall, just outside in Corporation Lane where they were exercising, place the barrel of gunpowder, light the fuse, blow a hole in the wall, the guys would then run out and hopefully the escape was complete. The signal was a rubber ball, white rubber ball that was thrown over the wall. When they saw that, then uh, they were told to take cover and the explosion was imminent. It didn't take place. Uh, the, the rubber ball, oh, sorry, the, 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 exercise, uh, yeah, the exercising didn't take place because the authorities got wind of um, something was going to happen. So exercises took place in the morning and all the prisoners were in their cell during the afternoon. So there was no Casey and certainly no Burke to be rescued. However, their uh, comrades on the other side of the wall with the gunpowder didn't know that, so the rescue was to go ahead as usual. And yet another engraving. They used a huge amount of gunpowder, far, far more than that was necessary. Um, and the result was... Uh, was this huge explosion which blew not just that hole in the wall but also blew back across the road and damaged those houses. Um, ironically, if Burke had been on the other side of the wall, it's likely he would have been killed. So, a complete own goal in that, res that respect. But the aftermath was, uh, was both terrific and terrible. It was calculated that 56 families were unhoused, 600 families suffered loss and health, of health, injury to person and property damage. Six people were killed in the blast and at least nine more died from the effects of the explosion. The death toll does not include 20 babies that died from the effects of the blast on their prematurely confined mothers. It's quite well documented in the, in the records. And over 20, 120 civilians were wounded, a third with life-changing injuries. Um, and injured residents were also shell-shocked. Well, of that 120, 40 were seriously injured, life-changing, life including Arthur. 
Well, I've mentioned that a lot of, lot of uh, journals and newspapers covered the, the actual explosion, the, the effects of it and what, what it looked like afterwards. The engineer went just that one step further. They, they went into the technical details. So from this particular um, diagram, we can see exactly where the, the um, explosion took place. Once again, showing you how close the, um, the houses were to the prison wall. The engineer said the houses were reduced to a mass of rubbish. The narrowness of the street rendered the front face of the poor quality houses um, of the unhappy inhabitants an effect, effective fulcrum. So basically their proximity to the explosion, there was no way that they were not going to be damaged. Um, they also worked out that the, uh, from, a, a, from a stave, uh, a metal support from the barrel that was found, that it was to be a, it was a 36 gallon barrel, so pretty large. And at half full, that would take about 100, um, 150 pounds of, of gunpowder, which would devastate anything. And they worked out that any prison door in the land could be blown by about 20 to 30 pounds of explosive or gunpowder. So it just shows you that over, overestimated, miscalculated the amount of gunpowder needed, hence the, the devastation. And... Yeah, and again, we've got the, um, the interiors shown here, sort of devastation, complete frontage uh, of that particular house, which I think is number five. That was Arthur's house. But the other, uh, other residents in the street also suffered. 3A Corporation Lane uh, had 20 residents in seven households, all crammed in. Housing conditions were pretty, pretty chronic then. Five Corporation Lane, the same, 20 residents and eight households, including Arthur. And the whole street, numbers 1 to 7 and 11 Corporation Lane, 102 residents, 51 households and businesses. Bear in mind a lot of people work from home at that time as well, so they would have been working in their workshop or the cottage industry or whatever they might be doing at the time, and they were also affected. There wasn't one house in the street that wasn't affected by the, by the explosion. And coming back to Bedford La Mer again, he took photographs, so not dissimilar to the, the engravings that we've seen there. Um, another quote, this time from John Butler, who was a surveyor. The houses were very seriously damaged and were very much injured indeed. Now this quote, and what you're about to hear from John Butler, was taken from the trial transcript scripts of those that were indicted for the murder of um, the, uh, the, victi the, mur the vict uh, murdered victims of Corporation Row. And it's a very good source of information about what happened on that day. We've got the newspaper reports, but a number of months later, in April of 68, we have the trial transcripts, we have the trials taking place, and we're going to hear now from what John Butler saw. And we're going to try and be brave. We'll, we'll try that microphone, try that. and we'll see what happens. <laughs> this is John Butler. I am a surveyor. I have made a model of the house of detention at Clerkenwell and the surrounding neighbourhood. It is accurate and shows the part of the wall blown down. The width of Corporation Lane is 24 feet from the houses to the prison wall. I saw the houses that were blown down or so much shattered as to be dangerous. They were taken down soon after the occurrence. The roof of the house most damaged was partly blown off. The floors here were very much injured indeed. That was number 3A. Ten other houses were more or less injured. Number two was very badly shattered, so much so as to be unsafe. Of numbers four, five, six and seven, the windows and doors were blown in and the houses were rendered otherwise dangerous. The windows of numbers 1, 3, 1A and 2A were blown in and the houses were very seriously damaged. The windows of other houses were also blown in, and the sides and roofs damaged. Well, thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> really, it didn't... Uh, we've got an official report there, but it didn't take too much for people to know that uh, a lot of damage was, was caused, and buildings injured. But, of course, uh, we've got buildings injured. They can be replaced. But um, sadly, injured people, or in this case, the deceased couldn't. We mentioned there were six, six people that uh, were killed as, a, um, killed as part of the blast, but there were an awful lot more that succumbed to the effects uh, a little bit later on. 
But these are the, the six. In fact, I've added a seventh here. Um, the seventh doesn't seem to get a look in, in, in sort of official um, sort of tomes for, for a good while. But the deceased we have, William Clusson. Now, he was the only, he was the only um, non-Corporation uh, Lane resident. He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. William Clutton lived the, on the south side of the um, prison in St. James's Street, but he was in a stable in Davis Street, which is close to Corporation Lane at the time. Now, he was killed on the spot, assumed uh, from flying debris or a chunk of wall, something, a heavy blow to the chest. Um, he left a widow and an imbecile son. Well, I found out that the uh, sort of Victorian insensibilities there, he, the, the son was actually deaf rather than an imbecile, but uh, he was, he was labelled as such. Uh, however, uh, later, um, later uh, accounts suggest that he was actually killed, uh, not by debris, but by an escaping member of the IRB who struck him such a heavy blow in the chest that it killed him. And this guy was called Jeremiah O'Sullivan, who later on, given a description of um, um, William Clutton, said, I think that was the man I hit in my escape. So we can't prove it, but poor William was not in the right place at the right time. Uh, nor really were any of them. But uh, then we have Sarah Hodgkinson, uh, 3A Corporation Lane, wife of, of a tailor, Henry. Uh, Sarah Ann was a needlewoman, and she was killed while working at home mentioned those sort of cottage industries. Her thimble was found on her finger and a needle and thread in her hair when she was taken to hospital. So hopefully she didn't know too much about it, but she was at work and that, that was that. She, she was uh, killed hopefully instantaneously. Little Minnie Abbott was seven. Uh, she lived at Five Corporation Lane. This was Arthur's older sister. Um, she was killed also. She got to hospital but died on arrival. Mother and three brothers uh, were also injured, including Arthur, and a sister in hospital. So the whole family, basically, um, was affected, except for um, the husband, uh, Henry, who was uh, working, and young Henry Jr., who was only a year old. He was un unhurt. Humphrey and Martha Evans of 3A Corporation Lane, uh, same household as Sarah, uh, they died um, instantaneously. And Daughter Hannah was also badly injured. She was one of the nine that succumbed to injuries a few years later. Martha Thompson, again, 3A Corporation Lane. Martha's uh, mother, uh, three sisters were in hospital. Uh, father, who was uninjured, but he went much mental affliction since. And one of the records show that he actually died eventually through, his, uh, through being devastated by his family, uh, family's affliction. So Martha was 11. And lastly, the one that doesn't tend to get is Harriet Bolzoni Shepherd. She lived in St. James's Walk, not far away, again, just, just adjacent to um, uh, the prison. Uh, but she was due to shock and exposure to cold bronchitis. Harriet, Harriet died in King's College Hospital a few days later. Her medical certificate connects the cause of the death with the explosion. So not outrightly injured, but the effects were such. Two years later, um, as you can see today, in St. James's Church, Clerkenwell, we have a memorial tablet to the, the, uh, the dead. Uh, just the six, in, excluding Harriet, but nine are mentioned there. And actually, it's, 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 for a tablet, it's quite detailed. It really tells the story very, very well. Um, and you can, you can uh, visit that and see that today. And that was two years to the day after the explosion in 1869. Um, refer now to some of the records I mentioned earlier. This is the Clark and World Explosion Relief Fund. This is the Register of Claims and Compensation where a meticulous detail were taken of all the injured and all the claims, not just physical, but also the, the effects upon businesses and, of course, houses. And this is the Abbott family. Henry Abbott was at work, so he was uninjured, uh, obviously affected by the whole thing, though his house had gone, uh, not least his uh, daughter Minnie and the family. Maria Abbott, mother, uh, she lost her, her right eye destroyed, lost her eye, severe cuts to the forehead. John Abbott, who we've, we've mentioned in Arthur's, um, he, Arthur's um, testimony, numerous contusions of face. Frederick, uh, lacerated cuts on hand, neck and face, portion of his nose cut off. Minnie Abbott killed, died a few minutes after being taken to hospital. And Arthur Abbott, down the bottom there, blinded, incised wounds, deep wounds of face and neck. And little Annie, down at the bottom there, she suffered slight concussion. 
Now we're just going to quickly introduce you to the Clerkenwell Explosion Relief Fund. Um, the record we've just seen comes from that fund and this was a fund set up almost immediately, a couple of days later, by the Reverend Maguire there, a man from Belfast, who was the incumbent of St James's Parish Church in Clerkenwell, together with another Robert called Robert Paget, who was the town clerk or the, the CEO of the, the, the local vestry, local council. And between the two of them, they um, organised the Clerkenwell Relief Fund. Now, sympathy was such throughout the nation and beyond as well that uh, donations started to flood in for the victims almost immediately. So what, uh, what uh, Maguire and Paget did was to coordinate that. The relief fund was established on the 16th of December at a meeting at Carkenwell Parochial School in Elmwell Street. After the initial few meetings, it then moved to the vestry or town hall. Now, on the day of the, the um, money had already been sort of exchanged, exchanging hands. Uh, the government handed relief on the day over the weekend, totaling £275. Quite unusual for a disaster. The Victorians weren't, um, it wasn't unusual for them, to, for them to know of disasters or experience disasters. Mine explosions, boiler explosions, traffic, uh, transport accidents. But it's very, very, very rare for the government to get involved because there was a political slant on it probably one of the reasons why they did. Um, but what they, once they dished out their £275, which a good percentage went to those in Corporation Lane, they decided that, well, experience has shown that in cases like the present, well, it really wasn't a case like the present, but disasters, a private agency is the most effective channel of relief. But the government also feel that they would not be justified in arresting the sympathy of the public to the, with the victims of the atrocious act. In other words, they weren't going to pay any more. They were going to leave it to the public to, um, to, uh, to donate. And the public did donate. In fact, in I think the first 10 days, they raised, raised £3,000. And over the next six months, they raised uh, to over £10,000 for victims. They'd worked out who needed what and what buildings needed sort of uh, um, attention. Now, that gives a date of 1869, but that was when the final report was. But the majority of the, the, the fund was collected within about six months. And very successful it was, too. Um, just, as a, just as an example, a month earlier, there was a mine disaster in the Rhonda Valley, the Ferndale disaster, where 178 people died. Uh, in the first three weeks, they'd only collected... Um, about uh, 600 pounds, 200 pounds of that was from, the, from Queen Victoria. And it took three months for the local authority to get round to organising a relief fund. So compared to Clerkenwell, that was, a, that was terrible. Whereas Clerkenwell, they were at it immediately. And the Abbott family compensation, 7.2% uh, of the fund went to the Abbotts. So £723 pounds were allocated. There was an annuity for Maria, uh, £349, pounds, which was to be paid £20 pounds annually. All these monies uh, for annuities and investments were uh, put into the Finsbury Savings Bank just around the corner. The building is still there. Unfortunately, Maria died in 1881, age 47, as did her husband, Henry, and the annuity then disappeared. The boys, John, Frederick and Arthur, received £100 each, each to be paid when they reached the age of 21. John's amount in 1876 amounted to 122, Frederick in 1878, 130, and Arthur received £147 in 1883 when he was 21, which I'm sure would have come in very handy. John and Frederick both married. John died in 1930 uh, in Islington. Uh, Many of them didn't move far from the area. Frederick, I, I couldn't, find his, uh, couldn't find when he, he died. The funeral of Minnie, clothing, furniture, convalescence. Uh, that was Maria. She went down to Littlehampton for a few weeks to recover. And weekly payments totaled £74. Things like work tools, obviously clothing, um, all the things that were just disappeared in the explosion. And there was no compensation for little injured Annie who sadly died in 1870, the age of five, not attributed to the, um, to the explosion. 
and there was no compensation for uninjured younger brother um, Henry either. Right, that's sort of part one of the story sort of setting up. Um, we're going to briefly look at uh, Henry's life now. What happened to him afterwards? Well, Henry was born on the 18th of March, 1862. He was born whilst uh, his mother and father lived at Five Corporation Lane, so that was the only house he knew. Uh, he was baptised in St Sepulchre Church in um, just a few, uh, about a month after he was born. This was his mother's parish, his mother Maria Slaughter, um, born in 1834. This was her regular church and all of her offspring were baptised at this church. Henry, the father, uh, was born locally in Clerkenwell. He was a couple of years older than Maria, born in 1832. Um, not that you probably need reminding now, but here we have a picture of, uh, on a map of the location, Five Corporation Row. And on the right hand side, St Sepulchre Church and Arthur's baptism certificate there, showing Arthur Henry the parents, Henry and Maria Abbott, Five Corporation Lane. And the father's, uh, the father's occupation was there a brazier or a coppersmith, someone who worked with copper. Now, we hope to think that the first five years of Arthur's life was, was a normal childhood, but on that fateful day in 13th of December 67, things changed. And the explosion itself was one that really, really sort of defined his life and um, so forth. But after the explosion, for the, for the next uh, four or five months, he spent uh, recovering in, in, in um, the Royal Free Hospital here. Most of the injured went to St Bart's, that was the closest hospital, but six of the injured, including Arthur, went to, um, went to the Royal Free in Gray's Inn Road, just over in the parish of St Pancras. Um, newspaper reporting was still strong at this time, but they took a particular interest in young Arthur. And we can actually track through the media his, uh, his recovery. And this is what we're going to do now. We're going to have a look at some of the newspaper reports that feature um, Arthur's recovery. Cambria Daily Leader, Wednesday the 18th of December 1867. Dr. Alexander Marsden, General Superintendent of the Royal Free Hospital, report that Arthur Abbott passed a good night and is doing well. Magnet, London, Monday the 23rd of December 1867. Arthur Abbott is getting on, but likely to lose the sight of his left eye, in addition to that of the right, the ball of which is ruptured. Weekly Dispatch, London, Sunday the 29th of December 1867. Yesterday morning, Dr. Jenner, Physician in Ordinary to the Queen paid a visit to the sufferers in the Royal Free Hospital, Gray's Inn Road, having been requested so to do on Her Majesty's behalf. Mr Gant, under whose care the, pa the patients have been since their admission, states that the eyesight of the boy Arthur Abbott is entirely gone. Dublin Evening Mail, Tuesday the 28th of January 1868. Arthur Abbott has lost the use of one eye entirely and serious doubts as to the other. London Evening Standard, Wednesday the 5th of February 1868. I understand that Her Majesty the Queen has signified her gracious desire to provide the little blind boy Arthur Abbott with an admission to a blind asylum. Robert Maguire, incumbent St James's Church, Clerkenwell. Hoban Journal, 22nd of February, 1868. On Tuesday, the Bishop of London, Archibald Tate, Mrs. Tate, and the Reverend Robert Maguire visited the sufferers of the Clerkenwell explosion, now in the Royal Free Hospital, and were accompanied round the various wards by Dr. Marsden. They expressed themselves much pleased with the improved and cheerful patients. The poor little fellow, Arthur Abbott, who has all but lost his sight, rode his little horse about the ward, much to the satisfaction of the visitors. Bayswater Chronicle, Saturday the 14th of March, 1868. The little boy Arthur Abbott, who has lain so long in the Royal Free Hospital, and who it was feared would be blind for life from the injuries he had sustained 
at the recent explosion in Clerkenwell, has suddenly recovered the use of his eyes. Well, after all that sort of uh, trauma in hospital where he was going to lose his sight all of a sudden, he's, uh, his sight has uh, regained, which was fantastic news for, for Arthur. Now, whilst Arthur was laying, um, recovering in hospital, things were going on elsewhere, and particularly the trial of those indicted for the explosion or the murder caused by the explosion. So Arthur being five or oh, six at this point, um, sixth birthday in hospital, wouldn't have known anything about this or taken a particular interest because of his age. However, the media did. And on the 6th of April, the trial began of six people, if you want to call them the Clerkenwell Six, that were rounded up for, um, for the, um, for the uh, uh, willful murder of Sarah and Hodginson. They just needed one person to, to make the indictment. William Desmond, Timothy Desmond, Nicola, Nicholas English, John O'Keefe, Michael Barrett, alias Jackson, and Anne Justice. Those six were indicted. Uh, they stood trial at the Old Bailey. Um, these were known to the police as either sympathisers or members, according to them, of the IRB. Uh, Michael Barrett, in particular, was one of the, the staunch IRB sort of members. Um, now, the trial took place over three weeks. Of the six, five were found not guilty um, due to insufficient evidence. They had, uh, they had, their legal representation was really, really very, very strong. The only one found guilty was Michael Barrett. He was given a rookie barrister and um, really couldn't prove the case. So Michael Barrett was found guilty and he was sentenced to hang. However, there was a bit of an outcry because evidence suggested, uh, and after he was sentenced before hanging, that actually he was in Glasgow at the time. But I think he, there was a scapegoat needed. Someone had to swing for it. Even Queen Victoria got involved saying, no, he's guilty, he's got to hang. And hang he did. He, he was hanged on Tuesday the 26th of May, outside, uh, 1868, outside of um, New, uh, uh, Old Bailey, or Newgate Prison, one of the same. Um, he was also the last person to be publicly hanged in England. Um, bear in mind at this time the reports of people, thousands turned up for the hanging, but also people going to the hanging by tube. By this time the tubes have come in and it seems a very strange thing, ancient meets modern, where you could actually go to jump on the tube to see a hanging. But he did, uh, Michael Barrett. Um, incidentally, um, Richard uh, O'Sullivan Burke was also tried uh, at the Old Bailey at the same time and he was found guilty of treason. Now, he was on remand and uh, set, um, on trial for his role in the escape and death of a policeman in March 1867. Um, but he was found guilty. Casey, his uh, colleague, was found not guilty. He was sentenced to 15 years, but um, he didn't serve those 15 years. He served about three years. Due to ill health, he was released. Went back to Ireland, got married. From there, went back to America where he, he was still a, a staunch nationalist, but he actually uh, ended up as the uh, assistant borough engineer of Chicago, of all things. Um, wasn't the end of him. He returned to Dublin in 1915, where he was seen as the link from the old IRB from the past, just prior to the Dublin uprise in 1916. But he had lived a long life. He died in 1922 in America. So he, he sort of got away with it, if you like. Right, for the next few years, uh, Clark and Well was in disarray. Corporation Row got rebuilt. In fact, it got rebuilt a number of times. Uh, houses were rebuilt, but none of the residents who were in Corporation Row before went back again. That's according to the 1871 census. Those houses in, themselves came down 20 years later, and Northampton buildings, a big sort of uh, a big tenement block, was put in its place. Uh, as for the Abbott family, uh, I first picked them up after the explosion in Cowcross Street um, in January. This was the evidence from a baptism, um, but also 1870 saw the death of young Annie, um, aged six. 1871 census, we see them in St James's Street, Clerkenwell, and this is a, an image from uh, 1943 of St James's Row, or St James's Street as it was, uh, give you some idea. Now this was the street that also William Clutton 
who was uh, struck that fatal blow lived in as well. The houses are not there anymore. But they lived there in 1871. Uh, we have uh, Henry, coppersmith, Maria, John, apprentice coppersmith, um, Frederick, uh, errand boy, and Arthur, a scholar. Um, there's no mention of him being blind. I don't know if your family historians amongst you. There's always a section on the right-hand side of a census return which gives, gives uh, uh, is the person blind uh, uh, or otherwise deaf, and it wasn't mentioned. So I'd like to think that Arthur's sight was, uh, was, was holding up, as it were. And we had Henry, and also Dora. Dora was a new addition to the family. She was born in 1867, and we have a, a boarder, John Williams, there. We have three households uh, in, the, in the building, 14 occupants, including a bookseller, printer, and a solicitor's clerk, so a bit of a mixed bunch there. Um, we jump on 10 years, and they move, strangely enough, uh, away from Clerkenwell, that they've known all their life, and they move up to the Finsbury Park area. Uh, 1881 finds them in uh, Riversdale Road, which is just off Blackstock Road, for those who may or may not know the area. Henry, still a coppersmith. Um, we have Maria, um, presumably a householder. And Arthur as an apprentice, a, copy, a coppersmith, with Henry, the younger brother. And Florence, who I think is Dora, uh, is a scholar, aged 11. We have three households here, 12 occupants, including a tramcar conductor and a needlewoman. So still sharing, the, uh, typically sharing uh, a whole house with other households there. Um, why did they move to um, uh, Finsbury Park area? I don't know, to be honest. It could be that they'd had enough of Clerkenwell, too many bad memories. Rents could have gone up, even though it was an impoverished area. Uh, rents were pretty high in, um, in Clerkenwell. It was part of the sort of inner industrial sort of London perimeter. So lots of jobs around which forced rents up. Um, and they may have wanted just a clean break. After all, Finsbury Park was pretty close. Um, unfortunately, later on that year, 1881, uh, both Henry and Maria died leaving Arthur. However, good news uh, on, the, on the horizon. Just a year later, uh, Arthur has moved from Riversdale Road, just round the corner, literally round the corner, to number 233 Blackstock Road. And here we have a, an image of the original house there. But this time, um, he's, uh, he's married. On August 28th, he marries Rose Smart, who's a year older than uh, Arthur. Rose is from Gloucester. Not sure where they met, but uh, possibly in, in uh, Clerkenwell. But she was in service, so perhaps they met, met in the street. They were married in St John's Church, Highbury Vale, which is now Blackstock Road. The church no longer exists. And here we have the marriage certificate. Uh, Arthur, who was 20, bachelor. He was a brazier, coppersmith. It seemed to be interchangeable, living at Blackstock Road there. Got his, uh, his father, Henry Abbott, who's now deceased. Uh, he was also a brazier. So that's good, good news for... Uh, Good news for, for Arthur, someone to share the rest of his life with. They remain in the area, 1891. They see, see them still on Blackstock Road, uh, this time at number 162. And we've got a picture I took a few weeks ago. And it's uh, the shop, oh, the bu building is home to a cafe now called the Cinnamon Village. But when Henry and his wife were there, um, it was a cheesemonger shop run by a guy called William Sell. But also three households, including cells. It was eight occupants, including a gardener. Uh, either side of them was an undertaker and a butcher. Um, so a typical sort of high street, if you like, there. But if you noticed, Henry and Maria, uh, sorry, that should re read Rose. Henry and Rose um, had two sons, Arthur and Frederick. In 1894, there was another addition to the family. This was Rose, uh, Rose Jr. And by this time, they'd moved just round the corner to number 61 Monsell Road. Similar sort of, similar sort of setup. But uh, Clerkenwell beckoned, and in 1898, we find him back in Clerkenwell. Not near the prison this time, but he's in the Pentonville district um, in Henry Street. And there we see a map of, uh, of the area. Pentonville Road here, and just to the north we have that. Victorian sort of maze of streets, Rising Hill Street, Penton Street, Henry Street, Cynthia Street, and Rodney Street. Now this time, uh, 1901, we see Henry, 40 now, 
and a change in occupation, streets, uh, street match seller. But he's now classed as blind. Uh, if you recall for his, his, his account at the start of the, uh, the talk, uh, he said about, around about 1890 he lost his job owing to his blindness. The blindness came back and this time his, his job is as a street match seller which so many years on, 1937, we know he's still plying that trade. Um, apologies again, I put Maria there. It should be Rose at 40. Uh, Arthur Henry's now 12, Frederick 10, Florence, who was born in, um, born in Finsbury Park, she was uh, seven, and a new addition, Ro uh, Rose. We've got uh, Rose Valentine, who was born on the 14th of Feb, hence Valentine's, yesterday, in fact. So, uh, and yet another new addition, which is Ethel. So we got uh, two sons and three, uh, three sons and two daughters. They lived above a chandler's shop, a provision shop, um, run by the Pikes. There were six households, 22 occupants, including a house painter, shopkeeper, and engine labourer. Um, again, pretty cramped, pretty, uh, pretty full. But we know that Arthur was paying seven shillings per week rent. Now bear in mind he had that annuity when he was uh, 21, 1883. He got 147 pounds, which, which worked out at about six years rent. Obviously you wouldn't pay that at once, but gives you some idea. But he was paying seven shillings uh, a week. But was that enough? Possibly, possibly not. Um, in fact, we go on to 1902 now, and his match selling got Arthur into trouble. Now, Arthur appears uh, in the Kilburn Times, July 1902, uh, basically for, for, for begging in the street. And here we have an image of Kentish Town Road in the 1900s. And we're going to hear again from a newspaper reporter just what happened to Arthur. Kilburn Times, Friday the 18th of July 1902. Mendicity, the practice of asking for food or money because you are poor. Arthur Abbott, 41, a respectably dressed man living at Henry Street, Pentonville, was charged with placing himself in Kentish Town Road for the purpose of receiving alms. He stood in the roadway ostensibly selling matches and displaying a board on which was a statement to the effect that he partially lost his sight as the result of the explosion in connection with the Fenian attempt to blow up the House of Detention Clerkenwell in 1867. His sight had entirely gone for some years past. Six pounds, eight shillings, ten pence, three farthings was found on him. Prisoner said that during some of the winter months he received but little and his expenses were the same. He paid seven shillings a week rent and had to provide for a wife and five children. He was bound over for five pounds. Poor Arthur had a large family. Um, this was the only way he could make his living. Um, although it seemed quite lucrative. Uh, eight, six pounds was found on him. Presumably he didn't take that with him in the morning. Um, so people were very sympathetic to it. Was it the fact that he was blind? Was it the fact that he was a uh, victim of the Clerkenwell explosion? He had the plate around him that we saw back in 1937, so he kept that with him. But six pounds, eight shillings was no mean sum. In fact, it represented about four months' rent. Uh, but he was bound over for five, uh, for five pounds, so he lost, obviously, a good chunk of that. Uh, begging was Ill illegal, uh, so was selling uh, matches unless you had a street, license, uh, street vendor's license, which presumably he didn't have. So poor Arthur was, uh, was, uh, was caught there. Now we, we jump on to um, 1906. Now this is, this is something I thought I'd put in, but I can't prove it. Now, 1906, he's in 81 Pentonville Road, just, a, just away from Henry Street. But also, just looking through some workhouse records, I find there's an entry for uh, Arthur Abbott, born in 1861. Is this the same Arthur Abbott? Did he have to resort to um, poor law relief? In other words, going into the workhouse, City Road, which is St. Luke's workhouse, at the bottom of City Road. I don't know, 
but there's instances where for a couple of weeks in September, he's there. Um, I pick him up on the 1907 uh, electoral register at 12 Henry Street. He's, he's moved uh, premises, which later began 29 Donegal Street. 1908, we have an Arthur back in the workhouse and June, August, September again. Is that Arthur? I'm not sure. But it, it may fit in with, with his, his predicament. But in 1908, we see him now in 29 Donegal Street. Now, Henry Street had a name change uh, between 1907 and 1908 from Henry to Donegal Street. And here we see uh, 29 Donegal Street. And this is where he was. Donegal Street still with us today, but the houses have long gone. Henry 51, he's a hawker, another name for a street seller. Apologies again, that should read Rose. I think her second name was Maria, but it's Rose, his wife, 51. Arthur Henry has ceased be being a coppersmith. He's now a cocoa mixer. Not sure what, uh, apart from what it says, uh, I guess, mixing cocoa. Uh, Frederick William is a private in the Highland Light Infantry, so he decided to cease becoming an errand boy, previous uh, census, and now he's a, he's a soldier. Florence, uh, a packer, and Rose Valentine at school, Ethel's at school, and yet there's another addition to the family, Edith. So we've got three daughters there. Three households, 23 occupants, including a bricklayer, flower seller, and a labourer. So the same sort of uh, social, social and working uh, group that he's with there. 1914, we see him move to Southampton Street, again in the same vicinity. So he was, he was on, the, on the move quite a bit, uh, Arthur. Could he pay the rent? Who knows? It's uh, maybe a reason. 1921, uh, Ordnance Survey Map, 1913 again. This time he's moved from Calshot Street, so Donegal Street to Calshot Street, into Hermes Street this time, um, where he's going to be for the next 20-odd 20, 20 years. So 1915, certainly to 1939. Uh, his trade is still a hawker, he's blind. Rose, I've got the name right this time, she's now 62. Uh, Frederick works for the Glaxo Food Company in Camden Town. Ethel is at home. Edith is an errand girl um, at Farringdon Road, just down the road here. And so they were here for the next, say, 25 years or so. Now we're jumping up to 1939 now. And the um, reason why I've got this particular um, newspaper article up is that history's repeating itself. 1939 saw something called the S campaign or the sabotage, sabotage campaign, which was a campaign by the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, to cause sort of havoc around Britain. A campaign that lasted a year from January, to, January 39 to January 40. And the idea was civil disruption, military targets through explosions. In London, it was the railway stations and underground stations that seemed to um, be targets. King's Cross, Euston, Tottenham Court Road are all listed as targets. Over 300 uh, bombs or explosions took place in that year. So did Henry know of all this? What would he have thought? However, he was dragged into it in one way or, sh or shape or the other through this particular article, which uh, is from the Daily Gazette for Middlesbrough, of all way up north, but he's mentioned as, a, as, a, um, as someone from the past coming to the present, experience the same sort of thing. So we're going to hear a little bit from the, the Gazette now. Daily Gazette for Middlesbrough, Thursday the 9th of February, 1939. The present series of bomb outrages is a reminder that London still has a pathetic human link with the greatest example of this form of political intimidation the attempt to blow up Clerkenwell Jail on the 13th of December, 1867. Yet almost any day, writes a correspondent of the Manchester Guardian, one may see on the western side of Hoburn a blind man with a breastplate which tells that at the age of five he was one of the victims of the attempt to blow up Clerkenwell Prison. Arthur Abbott himself remembers very little of what happened to him. But one of the newspapers of the time tells us how he was taken, apparently blind, to St Bartholomew's Hospital. Right, 
Poor, poor Arthur, physically or otherwise, uh, he was, uh, must have been reminded of, uh, of the, uh, the attack on his, 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 uh, his house, himself and of course the family back in 1867, only to re be reminded 70 odd years later that the same was happening in, uh, across the land. So 1939, as we know, um, ca the, the S campaign started in uh, ja January. By September, the Second World War had broken out. Um, just after the outbreak of the war, um, Paul Rose Abbott died aged 78. Um, she'd been a constant at um, Arthur's side for 57 years, and it's quite, quite remarkable, really. And as we know, even at 70, uh, a couple of years later, when she was 76, she was still escorting poor Arthur to his spot in, uh, in, um, in Hoban there. Now, uh, Rose is buried at uh, Islington Cemetery, uh, where daughter Minnie, uh, uh, Arthur's sister Minnie uh, um, was, uh, was buried, as well as uh, Maria and Henry Abbott's uh, parents as well. And she was buried at Islington Cemetery on the 15th of September. She wouldn't have known, obviously, much of, sort of the early days of the war. <coughs> Excuse me. However, a couple of weeks later, the National Register was taken uh, by the authorities for uh, forthcoming rationing, conscription, and other movements as well. So it's like a, a form of census, if you like, taken in 1929th of September, 79, uh, 39. But Henry's not in Hermes Street. He's over in Ealing with... Uh, Sydney and Ethel Barber, uh, Ethel being one of the younger daughters. Um, so did they take him to safety over there? Uh, did he want to you know, get away from the idea of Rose not being around? Uh, what was the reason for him going over? We're not sure, because Hermes Street still remained in the Abbott family. This was, um, this was uh, um, Rose, uh, Flo sorry, Florence, the other daughter, who had since got married. She was still staying put in... Um, in uh, Hermes Street, uh, number 27. Did Arthur return? Was this just a, a brief visit? We're not sure. But we do know what happens to, uh, sadly happens to 29 Hermes Street. Uh, probably sept late September, early October, 1940, start of the Blitz, poor uh, Hermes Street got a direct hit. And we could see from the London County Council map here, um, Coloured purple, complete devastation, uh, beyond repair. So basically they were bombed out. Was, was Arthur in place at that time in residence? Not sure. Uh, it was a year after he had been recorded in Ealing. He may have come back, missed, missed his family, missed, um, missed Clerkenwell. But his, um, his, uh, his uh, other family and, and grandchildren by this time were still there. But they were bombed out. We're not quite sure where they went. Uh, the street was later... Um, repurposed. But what we do find that they all survived the war. 1945 remarkably sees them back in Riversdale Road, so they're back to Finsbury Park. Did they have some other connection to the area or um, uh, was it again an escape from where they were? They certainly couldn't be living in Hermes Street. Was this the alternative uh, accommodation they were given? But here we see Arthur Abbott and the Argent family his uh, daughter Florence, Florence Rose, married um, Thomas Argent, and they obviously took him back again. So those war years were a little bit hazy, but we do know they survived them. He survived the Luftwaffe and uh, more explosions and ended up here. By this time, Henry is, what, 82 years old? Hopefully his working life is at an end. He doesn't have to sell matches anymore. We're not sure what, uh, what went on after that, but um, he was there for the next... Um, seven years. Unfortunately, even Arthur's life has to come to an end. He escaped bombings from the uh, explosions from the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the IRA during their campaign, and more importantly, the, the Luftwaffe. So he was a real survivor. But um, So it wasn't explosions that got him in the end. It was a, a heart failure, sadly. And here we have um, his death certificate. He was living at 43 Riversdale Road. Puts, uh, puts, he's been put down as coppersmith, which is quite a nice touch, I think. Um, his son, uh, Frederick, was the informer at the, uh, at the Islington registrars there. And he, rather than put down match seller, which was what he was, of course, for most of his life, 
uh, put down coppersmith, so I think that's a nice touch. He actually died in the, um, actually died in the Whittington Hospital um, and was buried a few days later. And here we have his burial at uh, Islington Cemetery, uh, and that was on the 14th of January 1952. So within a week or so, he was, uh, he was in the cemetery. But he was, uh, he was laid to rest, not alongside or with his family, but they were there in the same location. And just got a picture there that was uh, from a newspaper in 1892 showing the, uh, the explosion victim's grave at Finchley Cemetery. Um, and they were the six, six people that died in the blast there, including Minnie. So he's sort of rejoining Minnie and, and the other members of the family that passed before him. So that's, that's Arthur's story. Uh, it's a very much a human story. We often have incidents where a bomb attack, an explosion, uh, a, a transport accident, but we don't really know what happens. People tend to become statistics. So by looking at the human story here of Arthur, we've, uh, we've sort of pushed the politics aside for, for, for a while and think, well, what happened to them? Was the, the fund that he was given enough? Clearly not. Um, but he survived somehow. Obviously with Rose all those years, 57 years, big family behind him. He's got a strong legacy. His grandchildren, he's got great-grandchildren. Um, possibly, ab though, above all, he's been remem remembered as one of the victims of, the, um, of the, the bombing there. So I think his was an important story to tell. It's just one of thousands. I've just picked Arthur. He was a young lad, didn't know what was going on in 1867. But by and by, we've managed to track his life through to his death. And what was his legacy? Um, I certainly don't think it was in vain. And I think uh, he should be truly and deserves to be remembered. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs> and thank you to also to, uh, to Arthur, John, and the rest. I'd like to thank Mark very much indeed for such a brilliant and comprehensive introduction to the Carcamwell explosion through the eyes of little Henry Abbott. And it's Mark himself who has unearthed all this information. So I think he deserves another clap. Thank you. Thank you. It, it just goes to show what people can do, and in places like this, what you can all do, possibly. You know, delving not just into your own history, but hopefully into the history of Clerkenwell as well. Um, I'd like to thank Chris Millington for his excellent reading. <laughs> I'd also like to think, thank Tom Ferber and his team very much for hosting this event. And I said at the beginning of the afternoon that this was our second uh, collaboration with uh, the LMA. Um, our third one will be, uh, just note for your diary, um, on Thursday the 7th of March. Very different to this one. We have Lou Wayne, the man behind the hat. Well. Um, you may or may not be familiar with Lou Wayne. You possibly are. It's because he's been very kind of cheesy paintings of hats, often quite luridly coloured, sometimes a little scary. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the work of Louis Wayne. I think Hallmark probably has a few Louis Wayne hat cards. Um, he was born here in Clarkenwell, and we're very fortunate again to have um, the engage engagement officer from Bethnal Museum of the Mind joining us to talk about him, so do come along. And please do come along to all our other events. We're only on week five of eight. We'd love to welcome you. Um, we're now gonna have some refreshments. And before you go, if I could ask you please just to spend a few minutes filling out the form at the back. It's our feedback form, which helps us to make this all happen. And thank you all very much, both online and in person, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if anyone's any questions that they'd like to ask, I'm more than happy to answer.